Tonight we we need to have that. That's a heck of a start to a show. But you know what? It's only one take on this program. Tonight we meet a libertarian candidate right here in Rhode Island. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. We never start over. We never start over. This is what this is the the pain of a live tape broadcast. Listen. If the guests can ask, hey, if I don't say something right, can we start over? I say, no! A start like that, you have to live with. Nice to have you. you know, the human condition. Uh, <laughs> Annalie Barreto is my guest tonight. Who is she? She's a candidate for state representative. She is actually looking to replace Ray Gallison, who is persona non grata now, the former House Finance Chairman. Uh, she's a libertarian, which in the past might have felt very weird but you know right now libertarians are beginning to crawl into some kind of uh, credibility and if their presidential and vice presidential candidate can make the 15 percent threshold and get into these debates they may be even prominent so stay tuned for that all right let's go to the rundown and check on what's happening here now that i've got my tongue back in its proper place uh, of course donald trump doesn't ever here's the headline that we're operating with now actually the tweets now the bottom one is the one that's caused all the strife Dwayne wade's cousin was just shot and killed walking her baby in chicago just what i've been saying african americans will vote trump i really don't understand how this guy's brain works and if you're a regular viewer to the show that's not a new uh, out loud question uh, that you know I have that he would have that kind of knee-jerk reaction and then for the team to come back more or less and say oh by the way you really ought to offer your condolences it's just no more evidence that all they do now the, two, the new team uh, is, is clean up his mess here's the latest from CBS you're living in poverty your schools are no good you have no jobs. Uh, look at my African-American over here. The latest Clinton ad accuses Trump of racial insensitivity. He gave them more fodder this weekend after the relative of an NBA star was killed in Chicago. Trump tweeted, Dwayne Wade's cousin was just shot and killed walking her baby in Chicago. Just what I have been saying. African-Americans will vote Trump. Clinton's running mate chastised Trump. We just ought to be extending our sympathy to the family. That, that, that's, the only, that's the only reaction that's appropriate. The day before, he had sought to tie Trump to the KKK. Values, Ku Klux Klan values, David Duke values, Donald Trump values are not American values. Trump did eventually tweet his condolences to the Chicago family, and his supporter, Chris Christie, accused Clinton and Kane of overheated rhetoric. This type of discourse in the campaign is just um, unwarranted, but it was started by Mrs. Clinton. Hillary Clinton is a bigot. Actually, Trump beat Clinton to the punch by about 12 hours. There has been a steady stream of bigotry coming from him. You know, I, I got to tell you, the, I, I get Hillary's argument, and she prosecuted a heck of a case last week. Uh, for the vice presidential candidate to be tying the KKK to Donald Trump is an overreach as well, and Chris Christie's right about that. Uh, but the Donald is his own worst enemy, and... Uh, now he's asking this question on Twitter about releasing medical records. Uh, I, I don't know how much America wants to dig into this. I really don't need to see the details on Hillary Clinton's physical. I, if she's okay to run, she's okay to run. If there was a problem, somebody would say it by now. Uh, Donald, of course, hasn't offered his taxes. And Hillary has. so. When it comes to real disclosure, I think he's kind of behind the eight ball, don't you? Uh, crazy. Washington Post has this theory, a headline here, that uh, this is all really about having a, uh, a TV venture. That when he doesn't make it, he's really kind of setting up for a TV network that will be a constant thorn in the administration side. That would be the Clinton administration. We'll see. Well, let's come back home here. The 610 connector is back in the news. There's a big meeting coming up tomorrow night. The front page of the Providence Journal highlights this discussion. Uh, we say U-turn simply because they've had to regroup on this entire discussion of the 610 connector. $175 million worth of federal money that was going to go toward this green space boulevard type of, you know, park that would supplant this ugly highway here uh, went down the drain because the feds didn't authorize it. And so the state says, hey, look, we still have $400 million in roadworks that we're going to assign to the 610 connector. 
but no one knows really what they want to build at this point. The city of Providence hired its own consultant and is having a meeting tomorrow night in town at uh, local elementary school from 6.30 to 8.30. Look it up and attend if you want to have a voice on this. But they say that, listen, Roadworks has got this whole thing covered. You know, I'm not so sure that the tolling part of Roadworks is going to live for the full day they think it will. Even though the legislation has been authorized, uh, there's a lot of second guessing going on in the General Assembly now. So that 610 connector, while it rots away, is still in complete limbo. Uh, going back to the national conversation on, on race, uh, Colin Kaepernick won't do that because he says there are too many problems with race relations and police relations. Headline here, uh, I'll continue to sit. And he kind of lays out his rationale in a locker room session with the press the other day. There are a lot of things that are going on that are unjust, people aren't being held accountable for, and that's something that needs to change. That's something that, you know, this country stands for freedom, liberty, justice for all, and it's not happening for all right now. Hmm. So he's going to sit during the national anthem, and, you know, the more, it's like one of those things where if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, does it make any noise? Now, obviously, it's visual, so if he's sitting and uh, he's not, you know, participating in the national anthem, a time-honored tradition here in America, it'll cause some consternation. Already, I'm sure you've seen some of the video of fans burning his jersey, and uh, I just think it's a whole hullabaloo, not about nothing, but about too much. You know, just because a celebrity, a star in the National Football League decides to exercise his own First Amendment rights, whether that's standing, sitting, flipping the bird, hanging a moon, whatever it happens to be, I will tell you, I think that uh, we give them way too much capital, you know, way too much equity in this conversation. He's got a point of view. He has a right to exercise his point of view. The team really can't say much about it and hasn't. The NFL really can't say much about it and hasn't. Although I will tell you this, uh, he's been injured, right, Kev? Kev's my resident football expert. Expert. He's, he's not the number one quarterback anymore no, for the 49ers. He's number two and perhaps, perhaps, although I'm sure he's committed to his cause, one of the smart things he might be thinking about here is, you know what, I'm not going to stand for the national anthem, which puts me in a very controversial position. And if I'm about to get cut, what are they going to do now? People will think they cut me for ideological reasons. Don't you think, Kev, maybe this yeah. secures his second place yeah. on the bench? Absolutely. Yeah, at a multi-million dollar salary. Not that that's part of the conversation. All right, strike three. Anthony, what's the matter for you? Hey, well, well, you, what, what is this? This is a really, well, I wouldn't say it's fascinating because I have no interest in what he does, but this guy can't stop this thing. I know what it is. <laughs> Lexis, it's sexting. Because she's the, she's the modern social, you know, network. Uh, like, I know what it is, and so does Uma who's had it up to here with this guy, strike three. She, of course, uh, is the most, uh, uh, she's the highest level confidant that Hillary Clinton has, and she's more or less sent him packing, right? Do we have another headline there? Do we use both of them? Oh, well, by the way, Onyville Systems got into this discussion. Uh, Instagramming, again, social media. That's why Lexi gets the big bucks. Anyway, uh, He's baggage now for the presidential race, and he's got to go. Reportedly, that relationship has been estranged for a year or so. I get what it is. Take a picture. I did, did you ever think that we'd live long enough to, to learn the term sexting? I don't know. You know what a libertarian is? You should. Do we have something here? What do we have? Oh, we have the website for the Libertarian Party. And so we shall talk to one of its candidates. Annalie Barreto is here. What do you think of that Anthony Weiner thing, huh? Something like uh, that. You know. <laughs> Does the Libertarian Party have an official position on Anthony Weiner? Well, um, not that I know of, not yet. But obviously, uh, we believe that everybody has the right to express themselves the way they want. However, right? the photos with him and his child is, you know, 
is a bit disturbing. He, his son Creepy. sleeping next to him. You know, there's a time and place. <laughs> exactly. So. Well, you didn't think you were going to be able to respond to that by taking the invitation to come to the TV show, <laughs> no, did you? No, I didn't. Welcome. Nice to have you. Thank you for having uh, me. Speaking of kids, uh, you run a preschool, right? I do. In yes. Bristol? In Warren. In yes. Warren. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how long you had the business? Seven years this past, actually, two weeks ago, I made seven years. Is this good? Yes, very good. Kids changing? Yes, a lot because of the, you know, the phones, the tablets, and things like that. Uh, you video do preschool, games. though. It's still, well, you'd be amazed they at how much. They don't come in with their own phones, do they? They don't. I don't know, phones. But some of them have things at home, tablets and things, and they, they definitely know how to use them, um, which is obvious. But I think that uh, you do see things changing. You see a lot less um, awareness uh, awareness in how to how to play just imaginably. Like, they have toys that, unless they do something, Mm. They just kind of sit there with them, which is kind of sad to me because well, I feel like. Forget your candidacy. I'd rather talk about <laughs> this. This is uh, no. I, 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 I find right. it fascinating. You know, right. and, and people, you know, want to know where your expertise is. Yeah, right. I, I'm very worried about about young people. I knew someday I'd get old enough to be able to say I'm very worried about this generation coming right. up. But I am worried about their interactive skills and their ability, you know, to just you know. Uh, use their imagination, mm -hmm. develop relationships, all of that. Right. You seeing a trend even in the seven years that you've been running the school going in the wrong direction? Um, I would say that I've definitely seen over the years children seem to be less into that imaginative play. My son is 11 so he's been I saw, you know, from the last 10 years, just it's, it's definitely different. Mm. The toys are much more interactive with the toys and not with other children. You know, when we look at stages of early childhood, there there is different levels of play. There's cooperative play, there's parallel play, there's all of these types of uh, milestones that they typically hit in social emotional development. And really, when you see some of the more parallel, where they play next to each other and not with each other, you have to really look at why is that? Is that because they spend a lot of time with devices or tablets or, or of that nature. You speak um, just a language that you're using here. Mm -hmm. It seems to me you have some expertise in this field. Are you studied in this field? I did. I have my license too. I have my Rhode Island teacher um, certificate in early childhood, which is pre-K through second grade. Mm -hmm. So this was a second career for me. I originally went to school for criminal justice. Really? And then, yeah. And I switched when my son was born. Cool. Yeah. When did you become a libertarian? I would say my involvement with the party happened slowly over the last year. I've been an independent predominantly forever, for as long as I can remember. Um, I have some friends that have been involved in the libertarian movement for quite a while. They worked a lot on the Bob Healy campaign. Mm -hmm. Some real good friends of mine, actually Daryl Gould, who was running in 67, I've known since probably in elementary school. Um, some of the other people in there as well I've known for a long time. So I slowly kind of went to, you know, I followed them, I went to a couple things, and then I have found that when it comes to f the, you know, the philosophy part of it, I aligned very well with libertarian. I just didn't know it, and I think that that's kind of where a lot of people are hmm. right now. Hold that thought. We'll mm -hmm. explore that when we come back. Stay with us. The Libertarian Party is active in Rhode Island. There are three state representative candidates, and Anna Lee is the uh, the lone female. Uh, District 69 running in, uh, to replace Ray Gallison, who is somewhere on the East Bay. Have you seen him anywhere? Actually, quite a bit. Do He's you? still out and about. I mean, we just had the about. 4th of July. We had all kinds of events that any Bristolian would it would be blasphemy if you didn't show up to. So. Right. <laughs> the, uh, the former House Finance Chairman. Mm -hmm. you have a thought on his exit? You know, I think that him stepping down was probably the right thing to do because you have other things going on in the state, you know, with like Carnivale and things like that where he's refusing to step down. I said, you know, I think that at the end of the day his resignation was probably the right thing and, and he handled well, Carnivale that. Carnivale thing happened after he got all jammed up. Correct, of course, but at the same time where there's, you know, we have other, that other incidents where this type of thing is coming to light and they're just kind of saying there's no story, whereas he just step down. It was a shock. In town it was a shock. My own mother was, you know, it's a very small town and it's one of those things where she was just like, I just can't believe it, you know, because he did, you know, everyone has a story of something that he helped them with. So it is an element of, but there's a bigger picture here that you need to focus on. So I think. But nobody knows what he's, what he's jammed up for. Well, that's true. There's, there's been allegations. There's rumor right. in your window. Right. You know, there's behavior at the state house. Right. It, it could be something financial. It could be the grant program. They went and right. cleaned up the grant program, and actually, right. it doesn't seem like there's that much wrong with the, other, other than the purposefulness of the money. Right. It doesn't seem like there's anything perhaps real dirty going on there. So it's it's kind of this mystery. What did Ray Gallison actually do to cause him to go? 
I got to get out of here. Right. Anyway, that's really not your issue. No. Well, you're here to, to replace him. Uh, when did you get interested in running for the seat? I would say once he stepped down and there was an open seat, so there's not an incumbent, and then there was another person who had kind of announced that she was going to be running, and I think that part of the problem with the elections is that a lot of it is incumbents running unopposed, or there's one person running unopposed, and I basically said, well, kind of almost jokingly, actually, like, well, you know, she shouldn't run unopposed, so I'll run. That's my district. This is Susan Donovan. Yes, you're talking about? exactly, yes. Yeah, well, now Todd Giroux, a perennial candidate, is right. getting himself into the mix. Right. You know, and he's learning to bite off a little less than he can chew, I guess. He, he's been, he's run for, what, Congress and governor or governor whatever. Governor a couple times, yeah. right. So he's running on that side, and there mm -hmm. are two Republicans. Two Republicans. Uh, which we'll have to meet now that we've got Natalie in here, mm -hmm. um, but actually, you have no urgency right now because you're not—you right. ha don't have a primary. I don't have the primary. No. How the hell did you get in here so early? <laughs> you networked your it's way. You, network, you, 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 you networked your way into this seat today. <laughs> I think um, so. Talk to me about the Libertarian Party and its mm -hmm. and its overall uh, attempted rise here mm -hmm. to to some kind of, of recognition with uh, Johnson and Weld mm -hmm. hovering in that nine to fourteen percent right. ratio, depending on where you see um, the state polling go. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Johnson was on national television this weekend saying he really thinks he's going to get to that fifteen percent. He could mm -hmm. bust well, he could bust things wide open. Right. Um, I, I, I don't know that he could win. Perot didn't. But he could really have an impact on this race. I agree. I think right now with the pres with the presidential candidates that we have and the debates that they have and the interviews and all of the type of speeches that they're making, there isn't a lot of talk like you hear from Gary Johnson. I think if he was to put be put on stage with the, the other two candidates, I think that he could take that conversation in a direction that it should be going. And I think that what he has to say a lot of people would want to hear as opposed to the two now that are just calling each other names. That and, direction and, should be what? should be what do you see next year what do you see four years from now what is the goal of the role of your role as president not so much of what you can't do what can you know what can you do for the country and I think that he would take it down to you know they talk a lot about being fiscally conservative they talk a lot about being socially cool you know and things like that and what, how they see the country um, going forward not so much you know what's wrong with each other you know they don't seem to be attacking when people ask you, what's a libertarian, mm -hmm. what do you say? You know, it's me personally, like I, I, that is that, there is that cliche, like the socially, the fiscally conservative, socially, you know, I would say cool now instead of um, liberal because I think that that's a cliche and I don't really want to be associated with just I'm half them and half them where mm -hmm. I say, you know, it's, it's about personal rights. It's about less government involvement in your everyday, you know, in your bedroom, in your pockets. Um, I, I think it's, Focusing on um, personal liberties, less taxation, less involvement. When I look for, in my personal opinion, with small businesses, I see a lot of regulations. I see a lot of interaction that could be detrimental to you know the competitive nature of what we're trying to do. And I, I find that, and me as a libertarian, I would like to see less regulations, less strangulation of small businesses and local businesses and things like that at a state level. Obviously, that's not at a country level. I'm speaking more of, you know, my goals, but. All right, we'll hit some of the hot button issues that the state legislature will have to deal with in the next session mm -hmm. with our libertarian candidate when we come back. Okay. Stay with us. All right, let's hit some hot button issues. The libertarian candidate, Annalie Barreto, looking to, to, to uh, you're running for the first time, correct? I am. Ever. Correct. Ever. For anything. Dog catcher, whatever. Uh, I was the class treasurer at Roger Williams. How'd that That's go? It. Good. Yeah, did you win? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Big margin? Yeah. What was your... Uh, I don't remember. It was long was, ago. Was Believe it or not, it was about 20 years ago. What, what, what was your platform? Uh, probably fiscally I'll conservative. I'll count money, right? <laughs> I, won't, right. I won't take it to won't any take cake your parties. Money, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, 38 Studios. Yes. That, I mean, that's a big one. I mean, we... Are people still talking about it in the district? I think so. I think, and I, I think that in the big picture, especially now with the headlines, like we're supposedly getting some money back and things like that. I think it's still staying fresh. You know, um, I don't hear a lot of talk. I will say, like locally, I hear a lot more about grants. I hear a lot more about the tolls and that type of stuff. Thirty-eight studios probably those conversations probably go on more with you know people in the party. We're you know we've been doing a lot of protests. It makes me very happy to hear that you uh, you're hearing about grants. You're talking about the big mm -hmm. grants. The the community action grants. You're talking about my favorites, 
uh, pet peeve for 17 years of hanging around this place, and that mm -hmm. is the legislative grants. Correct. Which ones? Well, I would say probably the legislative ones are getting the, the biggest headlines when you get into what's been going on you know, locally in my area, I would say. Well, the, well, those. Ray Gallison, you know, his, the controversies uh, that he's immersed mm -hmm. in are not necessarily about the legislative grants, right, even though he right. was in that pipeline. There's mm -hmm. a story in the journal today, actually, mm -hmm. that three of the legislative grants that right. he had, uh, they forgot to take his name off, whatever. It's right, no big deal. That. But do you hear from the from from the uh, the door knocking? And I'm guessing that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Are you? Are you walking, as they say? I have been. I did a lot, obviously, when we were doing collection, collecting signatures. I find that right now, I'm not doing as much just because I'm not part of the primary. So hmm. there's an element of kind I don't want to be the fifth person knocking on your door no, that today. Makes sense. So that makes sense. Once the primaries are done, then I'll definitely. Uh, but are, are you telling me that it's your own interest in legislative grants, or do people unsolicitedly ask you or talk, talk to you about them? That is definitely one of my initiatives. It's on my palm card. But I would say that door to door, when you really engage people, they talk about the money that's wasted and, and a lot of the, the corruption that they see. Unless they belong the, to an organization that, uh, that this is gets true. the grants. I mean, so that's the disease, right? right? Too many right. people touch too many organizations that get the grants. I think the big picture, a lot of the people I speak to don't realize how much money actually goes into this grant system and how it actually operates. So the fact that it's like... Do you? I do, I actually. How, <laughs> I mean, how much about, money goes in the grant system? Between the two, and there's about $13.9 million. On and, the bigger side. Right. Well, on the, that's... On the, the two, grants, it's about it's, two. Right. Ish. The legislature is about two-ish. Okay, good. But it's still the fact that it goes in as a bottom line on the budget. It's not, nobody gets a say on each individual thing. I think in the big picture, you, do you really want to eliminate all of them or can we really eliminate all of them? Probably not. But I do think that as a taxpayer, we should have a say where our money goes. Trolls, you're gonna, are you going to go in battle or do you think that's a uh, fait accompli and we're going to get them? I, I, that's something that I would definitely be fighting. I mean, I live, we just went through the whole Sakana toll thing. I think, you know, there was a person when I went for signatures that was arguing for tolls because on my palm card again it says you know that I'm against the tolls and he was like well who's going to pay for the roads and I think people don't realize that you pay for the ro roads every time you put gas in your car that there's already money that we've been paying all along slated for those roads whereas the tolls this plan is built upon a study that is not accurate it's kind of guesstimating how many trucks go through and in the end I feel that's not going to be the case, and it's just going to end up falling on us, the cars, you know, that are going to end up paying those tolls. And so what's your, what is the, other than those two major things, what's the one thing burning in your craw that you think is a big sell for your election? Manner? I think there should be a line item veto. There's 44 other states that have it. I think that the governor should be able to just eliminate things by the line as opposed to keep fighting and, and just letting things slip in because it's easier than having to deal with things. Um, the other thing is term limits. I mean, it sounds maybe detrimental to my, my goal here to get in, but I do think that there should be term limits. I think that a lot of the things that we see and a lot of the corruption that happens is because people have been in there for 10, 12, 14 years. All right, well, when we find out who's going to get through these primaries, come back, since this is a hot seat vacated right. by Ray Gallison. We'll have you on with uh, the winners, okay? Absolutely. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much for having me. Got it going on. <laughs> Final word, and we come back. Stay with us. Pawtucket lost a legend uh, over the weekend, a uh, very popular mayor from 1997 to 2010, James Doyle, uh, passed away. Of course, his son is a state senator. Uh, mayor never returned a phone call to me on the radio side, ever, other than when they had a big fire and he thought it was an emergency and people needed to have some information. I respected him for that. But I'd seen him around town, and actually he was a very pleasant guy and, and quite a character. Uh, he will be missed in Pawtucket, and my condolences to all who uh, will miss him, which is plenty in the entire city. Speaking of Pawtucket, uh, Bill Lynch will be in. He's from Pawtucket, of course, and he's now speaking for the Democrats tomorrow night. Be like old home day. See you. Bye.